Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on the Focus on Why podcast, I'm joined by Brian Main. Brian, welcome. Thank you. Lovely to be with you, Amy. And from the sunny Isle of Wight, you're joining us as well, or partly cloudy, should we say. <laughs> a little bit cloudy, but still some peeking through. Well, thank you for coming on the show today. I know a little bit about you. I've heard you present, which is fantastic presentations that I've been to. But for the audience's benefit, I just want to sort of start a clean slate and sort of say, ask you the question, what is it that you spend most of your time doing? I was speaking, uh, (laughs) but um, speaking to large groups of people at conferences and in these last months because of the uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown uh, online. So uh, And sometimes that can be thousands of people online, just like in a conference, it can be thousands of people. Occasionally, I'm also running smaller groups, smaller workshops. So I might be speaking with 10 business leaders somewhere in a group or uh, a Zoom call, but quite often it's uh, a large conference. And what are you speaking about? Uh, Self-improvement, personal development, sometimes uh, a little more towards spiritual growth and uh, goal setting, helping people learn very simple but effective ways of achieving what is most important to them. And why is that important to you to do that? Some years ago, uh, my life crashed quite dramatically, uh, nearly 30 years ago now. And I was in so much fear. Uh, I'd had an unusual childhood. I hadn't gone to school very much. I grew up in a traveling family. I left school at 13 uh, with no qualifications. In fact, I've never taken any exams in my life. And I never learned to read and write, partly because of traveling around a great deal with the fun fairs and the circus, uh, but also mostly really because I have dyslexia. I, when I left school, I worked with my father in the family business. And uh, my father and myself, uh, we become very, very successful with that business. And I was very wealthy, very young. But then that all come to an end at about age 29. And so I found myself in this really dire situation where I was in a lot of debt, nearly a million pounds of debt back in 1993, somewhere around then. And uh, my home had been repossessed and most of my possessions and my marriage had broken down. And it it was just looking really grim. I'd uh, signed on to the Dole Income Support uh, for the first time in my life. And of course, I had no qualifications and I wasn't able to read and write. I'd never had any formal work experience. And in, uh, I, I didn't, you know, I just didn't see how I was going to get out of the situation. I was becoming very, very depressed. And I was offered a, a job uh, at, in a sales team, direct sales team, commission only. So if you sell something, you earn something. And I wasn't selling anything. Uh, mainly because I I was a bit uh, negative and bitter about my experience and and not that sort of happy, chirpy person that people like to buy from. But the turning point for me was that the sales organisation I joined put on a special training, personal development training. And in that training, the trainer explained to me the science of positive thinking. And how I could use that not only to boost my sales performance, but to turn uh, my life around from the the dire situation I was in into something uh, more hopeful and promising. And I really bought into that. Um, I didn't think I would. I was a very close-minded person, actually. Um, But the things he said made a lot of sense. He made it very simple. 
I went and confessed to him uh, about my learning problems with dyslexia, etc. And he helped me understand how the same simple science of positive thinking and goal setting that the sales team were going to use to boost their performance, I could use to overcome my learning challenges. And within a year, I learned to read and I, I went through a huge change in myself in terms of my confidence and self-esteem. And I also went through a huge change in my life. Learning to read at age 30, I, I, it's difficult for me uh, to put that uh, into words. Even now, 30 years later, it makes me emotional to think about it. Uh, it, was, it was such a, uh, an uplifting experience for me. And I wanted to read everything because it was like a new skill to play with. You know, I'm going to read all this stuff and I'm going to read just reading uh, uh, like um, uh, place names uh, on, a, on a wall somewhere. It was just a new thing for me. And this man had befriended me and become my coach. And what he guided me to do was to read more and more personal development and self-improvement. And I become very interested in, in the techniques. One of the things that I, I realized, I learned to speed read within about 18 months. And uh, I was reading a book a week on personal development. And I realized mostly they're all saying the same thing. And what they're saying is that lasting success is not an accident. You can have some chance good fortune, like winning the lottery. But lasting success in your health, in your wealth, in your relationship, uh, that happens on purpose. It very much happens by learning and applying the principles of success. And I become fascinated in that. I, I'd sort of grown up not thinking too deeply about it all and thinking that by and large success was mostly luck. You know, sometimes we're lucky and we have some success and sometimes we're unlucky. And I thought, well, I've had a lot of success when I was young. Uh, but maybe I've used all my luck and it's gone now and, and no more's coming. So to uh, understand that, no, it's principle and you can learn it, you can apply it. If you live by it, ultimately, uh, you will bring success into your life and create it. And so I become very interested in the techniques to achieve that. And gradually over uh, a couple of years, I came to the realization I had like an epiphany moment and I made the decision that I would dedicate my life to helping others learn the simple techniques for changing their life for the better in the way that this man had helped me. And sadly, he died quite young. So uh, that gave like a, an added motivation for me to want to help others in the way that he had helped me. And something I've noticed there, Brian, is that you're talking about simple techniques, simple science, and, yeah. and making things simple. Why is it, it, why is it that the simplicity that is important for you? Because I think the simplicity makes it accessible. And I, I have worked for a lot of the very uh, well-known uh, top personal development trainers in the world, like Tony Robbins, Stephen Covey. Uh, and others. And my challenge sometimes when I'm working with those people is I, I feel that uh, sometimes their work is a little bit elitist, either in price, that it's out of the reach of many people that really need it, or that it's too academic in its nature, too complicated, and people that would really benefit from it cannot always understand it. And so for me, simplicity was the key. And I've become very interested in ancient wisdom, uh, ancient wisdom and ancient techniques. And the more I looked at ancient wisdom, very often it was simply put, and they had simple techniques to use. And while I wanted to understand the complexities and the detail of uh, neuroscience, for instance, and quantum physics, and I studied those things to educate myself because I was very, very limited, both in my education and my vocabulary I was very limited because of the community I'd grown up in as a child. I quickly realized 
that making it simple was the key. And with the techniques that I developed, uh, they were used very broadly. Uh, so uh, at the top end of my client base are companies like Microsoft, Siemens, Disney, Coca-Cola, et cetera, who are using my systems with their executive. Uh, but then I have more than a million children that have used my goal setting system in state school across 16, 17 countries, I suppose. So it's simple enough that children can understand it and apply it. And yet it's powerful enough uh, that world leading organizations also have their own trainers certified in it or will bring me in to make presentations or, or one of my certified coaches. And they will use it with their employees and executives. And it really is the simplicity that gives it that universal ability. So what is your mission? Well, the mission is to help people lift their lives. And I'm choosing my words quite carefully there because it's not about me lifting their life. It's about helping them to do it for themselves so that they're self-sufficient. And the difference for me between a purpose and a goal or a mission is that a purpose, like a life purpose or a mission, is an ongoing journey. It doesn't have a defined end date. It's something you are committing yourself to. And that may be only for a, a relatively short time, or it may be for an entire lifetime. And I believe I'll be doing what I do for the rest of my life. It will end one day, obviously, but I don't have a date in mind for when that will be. And the nature of my work means that I can keep doing it uh, very late into my years. However, uh, with a goal, that's about having a specific target and uh, an achievement date that you aim for. And so I decided some years ago that while my mission was to help people lift their lives, that was my purpose, like a path that I was following, that I would uh, set for myself a target to aim for. So looking up the path of helping people lift their lives, where do I want to be and by when? And the target I set was to reach 7 million people with the success systems that I've created and to achieve that by 2023. So I'm, I'm three years out and so far I've reached about 5 million people. Uh, it's taken me though uh, 25 years to do that. I started teaching my programs, I set up my organization, had my first website, etc. in 1995. And so uh, September 1995. So not quite uh, 25 years yet, but very close to it. 25 years this September coming. So with the self-improvement and spiritual growth journey that you took yourself on, can you remember how you felt when you realized there's this whole world out there? Yeah, I felt both excited and scared. Um, excited because I felt like I'd found some magic keys that could help me uh, achieve. And I and had become very fearful and depressed. Uh, going from being worth a million pounds at age 25, living in a big three-story house, driving a fast red Italian sports car, having really quite an amazing life. I was the youngest uh, licensee, the uh, youngest person ever in England, actually, to be given a license to open a disco and an alcohol license at just 18. Nobody's ever done it younger. So I had this quite amazing life when I was young and then lost everything, mainly with the end of tourism here on the Isle of Wight. Because in the late 1980s, early 90s, it was the time when airfare prices come down and uh, the mainstream English people started taking their main summer holiday abroad. And my customers, 18 to 30 in the disco, were really some of the first people to not take their holiday in England and to take that holiday instead in Ibiza, or Spain or Italy or Greece or somewhere, but, but not here on the Isle of Wight or, or other places come for that. So tourism died. And, and that was part of uh, the family business going out of business. And it seemed like the end of my world. And so to learn personal development, to get on that mission, 
uh, that felt like uh, a very magical thing. It felt amazing to be able to help other people. And what scared me was uh, that I knew that once I really committed myself, it would own me. And for me, it was a, a spiritual covenant, if you like, that I entered into where I uh, committed myself completely to the task of helping as many people as I could. And I knew it would define my life from that point on. And it, and it has. And all of my big life decisions really have revolved around at that central mission, including sort of who I met, who I mixed with, who I married, where we lived, uh, how that unfolded, et cetera. Uh, it, it become uh, the central pillar within my life. And that scared the pants off of me at first. You know, it's like, oh, you know, am I doing the right thing here? And, you know, it's the rest of my life. And, but it's been fantastic. And uh, it continues to be so. Uh, I have now something like where well, my main focus some years ago became helping other people teach my systems, not just me. Once I set the goal, and that was a scary thing for me, set the goal of reach 7 million people. I was meditating here on the island. In, there's a beautiful park not far from where uh, I'm sat now, just along the coast, a botanical gardens. And it become my habit to go there early in the year, the first couple of days. So, so maybe not New Year's Day, but the day after, somewhere around there. And I would sit and meditate and I'd think about the year ahead and I'd think about what goals am I going to set I think it was 2006 I was sat there thinking what goals am I going to set now for this next year and going forward and it was like a little voice in my head said help lift seven million lives and it seems such a grandiose thing it seems so uh, a bit pompous even seven million people I'd, I was thinking, who am I to think, oh, yeah, I'm going to help 7 million people? So I dismissed it. I pushed it out of my mind. But it kept coming back. And after a few days, I put it down on paper in the form of a goal map, which is the main system that I teach. As soon as I put it down on paper, and my mind automatically then gravitated to asking the question, how? I already knew why, of course, uh, the focus of, of your work. Um, that was clear for me. That was that driving sense of purpose that I had been on for some years. So I was thinking more in terms of how, how on earth am I going to reach 7 million people? And maybe I'm going to be really fortunate and uh, one of my books is going to become a bestseller or uh, Oprah Winfrey is going to invite me onto her show. Or, you know, but all of those are um, nice to have, but they're outside of my control. What's within my control? I don't have enough years in my life to make presentations, I, I, I think you know, it's an estimate, guesstimate. Maybe I've presented to more than half a million people over the 25 years because some of the conferences are very big and, of course, the numbers gradually add up. But this, there's not enough years in my life uh, to reach 7 million if I'm going to do it through presentations. And my books have sold well in my online program and all of those things, but logically, what I decided was that the best way to help a lot of people with uh, what I've created is if I have an army of people uh, that teach it to others. And so I started a certification program and now there are 1,400 and some teachers, trainers, coaches, therapists, business consultants, uh, people of all type really, and some people that just uh, I like to share it with friends and family that are certified uh, to teach my systems. And that gives me a really great feeling. That's for me like the big why, because it means that when I die, uh, there are people that will continue with this. So I'd, I'm pretty sure I will hit my target, hopefully by the date I've set 2023. But if I don't, it's not it's not a big deal. I've had to reset the date a couple of times because uh, I was over ambitious in how quickly I could do it. But I know that I will achieve it now. 
And, and once I reach 7 million, I don't want the work to just stop and say, all right, well, I've done what I thought I would do. And that's the end of it. I want it to continue. And having a lot of other people teach it means it will continue with or without me. And so that's that's become a much bigger why for me now. And earlier when you were describing the journey of learning to read and write, you got really emotional. Yeah. Why was that? I think it's connecting with how much fear and desperation I felt and a a sense of um, not being good enough. I had a life that I know people envied. I was wealthy. I was uh, with an amazing woman. I had my own disco. I was the youngest licensee. I drove a Ferrari. I know I had a life that people envied, and at the same time, I felt I was not as good as others. I felt that I was less than other people. I was insecure. I often put on a cocky front to cover it up and be egotistical, a little bit of a bragger and a boaster at times and uh, dismissive of people. But all of that was to hide the feeling inside that I wasn't good enough. And that feeling had come from, uh, been generated from a lot of different uh, things I'd experienced in my life. I was quite embarrassed about my traveling gypsy background and leaving school early and all those things. But the main thing really was not being able to read and write. I was uh, desperately embarrassed by it. And then to uh, lose everything and to feel like, oh my God, you know, this, I don't know what I'm going to do. The only thing I could think of doing at that time was that I would go back to the traveling fun fairs and that would you know be my life for some years and so to learn that I could turn that around and really the the first aspect of believing that I could turn my life around was that learning to read it was achieving that goal more than anything else that gave me the sense of belief and hope for the future and the level of gratitude I felt to this man that had helped me. I I had no benefit to himself. He wasn't paid anything extra uh, by the company to uh, give me that extra help. He he was obviously paid to put on the training in the first place, but it was his own uh, decision and uh, contribution to help me. And so that's had a lasting impression on me. And and then uh, to lose him quite young, I had him as my as my coach for a few years, but then he died. And so uh, that really strengthened my uh, conviction that I should give myself to helping others. Of course, I'm, I'm giving to myself. I, I uh, live a good life. It's, it's not all work, but I've made the purpose my central thing and uh, success, whether that's financially or in other ways, has really been as a consequence of following that purpose. And with the science that you learned and the science that you've got in terms of explaining your goal mapping, explain how that works for people who haven't heard of the the, the system. The science of positive thinking is really simple. It's common sense, but not common knowledge because people don't think think deeply enough about it or with enough sort of clarity and guidance to always understand it until they enter into a presentation. But in essence, each of us have billions of brain cells or neurons. And the estimate is that we each have around 100 billion brain cells. And each one of your brain cells or neurons grows little branches out of it. So if you imagine my my fist here is the brain cell, it grows these branches called dendrite. And separating all of the brain cell arms is a little gap called the synaptic gap. And when you have a thought, it starts in the middle of the brain cell and it's like an electrical spark, like an impulse. And the impulse travels out along all the arms and the branches and it wants to connect with another but you have this gap that separates them. The key thing to understand is 
if the thought that you choose to think is positive. And I'm selecting my words carefully there because it is a choice. So maybe something happens in our day and we have a, an instantaneous, spontaneous, negative response. Someone is rude to us. Or we feel threatened by someone. I saw it in the supermarket the other day, with someone getting too close to someone because of the COVID-19. And you can see they, they felt threatened and they had a, a negative response. Within a moment or two, it's a choice. And if we choose to hold a positive focus, uh, either of ourself, we focus on what's right about ourself, you know, I like myself, I'm okay, or we focus on what's right in our life, or down to a single situation, like uh, me and you doing this interview now, me focusing on uh, it's going to be great. By holding that positive thought, the impulse stimulates the release of a chemical from the end of the brain cell arms called serotonin. Serotonin is the happy chemical, gives us the feeling of well-being. It's the same chemical that's released if we take an antidepressant drug, such as Prozac. When you train your brain by learning the science of positive thinking, you can literally train your brain to release more serotonin. And every time you hold that positive thought, it triggers the release of serotonin and it gives you a good feeling. There are lots of medical papers written on this. In my workshops, I get people just to experience it in the moment. If, if you focus your mind, and it may be years ago when you were a child or very recently, and if you focus on something good that's happened for you, some happy experience, or one that you believe is coming soon in the future, as you focus on that, that happy memory or thought, it triggers the serotonin and you start to feel happy right now in the moment. Every emotion we have is created this way. Neurotransmitter chemicals released from our brain that give us a feeling. What releases the chemicals is our thoughts, it's our consciousness. And so think a positive thought, it releases serotonin. And as well as giving you a good feeling, serotonin joins the brain cells together allows your thought impulse to continue on its journey. And as you connect two or more brain cells, you have that aha moment where you get that light bulb experience and you see an answer to your problem or you find a way forward. And through the release of the serotonin, you develop that motivating feeling of confidence that helps you face your fears a little of the unknown, take a step outside of your comfort zone, and take your idea and, and go forward and do something. Now, the challenge is, because this is a naturally occurring process, is that the brain cells join together. We have that aha moment, but then the brain cells break apart again. There's a, a little saying in neuroscience that brain cells that fire together wire together. So if you Repeat the same thought over, and this is how we create habit patterns. And you repeat the same thought, let's say a few times every day for 10 days minimum, but 30 days or more is better. Gradually, the brain cells become connected and they form a new belief. And that's why setting goals is important, because the process of setting goals is you take your thought, your good idea and you put it onto paper. And by looking at it once a day, you are reminding yourself, you're reestablishing those brain cell connections, you're re-releasing the feel-good chemical serotonin, it's producing a positive winning attitude, it influences both your physiology and your behavior, and it influences your subconscious mind, your little personal autopilot, to move you towards the achievement of the goal. The technique that I created, and it was just sort of an aha moment that came in 1994 as a flash of insight, is called goal mapping. And uh, goal mapping uses a combination of words and pictures to stimulate both the conscious mind, which tends to think in words, 
and the subconscious mind, which responds to imagery or pictures. And in the process, you engage both your logical mind and your creative mind. And it's by working with your whole mind, holistic thinking, that we really help ourselves to be at the best. And in this modern age that we live in, it's a key survival ability to be able to think holistically, to use the so-called right side of your brain, the creative mind, which has the gift of imagination, to look into your future and imagine how you would like your life to be. And then in balance, to work with your logical mind so that you can formulate a strategy, make a plan, follow through, and be effective in your daily actions to manifest your desires, to, to create the goal. The goal mapping system I created has seven simple steps that guides the user through thinking, well, what do I want? Right brain. What's the priority? Left brain. What does it look like if I map it out? Whole brain. Why do I want it? Is a really important step number four. When, because without a date, it's not really a goal, it's just a wish. How, what are the actions I will need to take? Who, who's going to help? Is it just me or are there significant others uh, that will also be involved in this goal? Because sometimes, of course, we have uh, joint goals, team goals, etc., community goals. So I just want to share a personal journey in this. I set my first goal map on the 30th of September 2016, and it was a three-year plan. And my mission overall there, or the biggest goal uh, with all the moving parts that needed to do that, was to allow my husband to retire from his work on the 30th of September 2019. And I was out by three days. But I know for sure, and I don't beat myself up about that, I know for sure that I would not have been able to have done it without having that constant reminder both in the words and the images and it was everywhere it was in my wallet it was on my my under, underneath my floor desk mat I had a, a massive a1 sheet so yeah it, it worked oh, you. I didn't know that you didn't tell me that no I thought I'd leave it for a special moment <laughs> I'm so pleased to hear that yeah uh, and I'm sure you get you hear so many stories like that yeah it's some great stories really great uh, I cry a lot <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, people write to me and they tell me about how they've uh, paid off their mortgage, how they've become financially free, put their children into good education. Uh, they've retired early or they've helped their partner retire early. In fact, um, I was contacted a couple of weeks ago by a lady exactly like you, uh, set the goal that her husband would retire. He was quite a bit older than her, so uh, she really wanted him to be able to retire early. Uh, but yeah, amazing stories. I had one that uh, was interesting, which was that I was in Finland for my book launch there. The goal mapping book's been translated into, into quite a few languages. And when it was released in Finnish, they asked me to go to Finland, and make a presentation. And a lady approached me halfway through the presentation, which was about two hours long, like a mini workshop, and told me that she'd been blind since a young child and that uh, she had some goals she wanted to achieve but how could it work for a blind person because of the the imagery and she could obviously say the words but uh, it was about she couldn't draw the pictures of course in a goal map or use the online system but after some conversation it was it was clear that she does visualize so you know, even though she's not sighted, you know, she she in her mind she can picture and what a table is like and legs and you know, all of those things. Of course, she has a picture of life in her mind. And so uh, we talked about that, and and she went away and she created her map where she had both the recording of her voice telling herself her goals to reinforce it from a left brain audio perspective. And then she had uh, cut out shapes with thick cardboard on, on a map, and she would feel those and, uh, and picture it. And I heard no more from her. And it would have been around 
around the same time that you've mentioned 2016, uh, 2015, 2016, somewhere there. And then, um, and then one day I received this package and I opened it and it was from her and a letter that she'd had somebody write. And uh, in the package, it was a CD, uh, audio CD of her songs. And she'd had these songs in her head since she was a child. Uh, but she'd follow through with her goal of going to a recording studio, creating an album, and it, and, and it sold well in Finland. And I, I've got it. I play it every so often. It just makes me cry. She's got a voice like an angel, uh, which is, which is um, emotional in and of itself. But it's the thought that, and she was 67 uh, when she was in my presentation. So she'd been with it for a long, long time, you know, this, this desire to, to achieve her goal. But she was just lacking a way forward and the belief. And the technique helped her to have that. And, and then through her achieving that goal, her CD has reached so many people. And uh, her voice and her music is so uplifting. I just uh, I love those stories. Have you thought of collating them? Yeah, I have. In fact, I uh, had a Norwegian filmmaker present, uh, approach me rather, not present, approach me and uh, made the suggestion that we, we should have a documentary and collate the stories. And so I, I think we will do that. I'm, I'm still in contact with him. A lot of my work's been in Scandinavia. It's uh, one of the areas where I've been so many times. And so uh, there, are, there are people and stories from many countries. I've, I've spoken in 30 countries. I know that your your work's very international as well. Mm. I just I think it's incredible because your purpose, your mission of helping people to lift their lives. Now you say that as a as a sort of sentence, but when you actually think about those seven million strands and those seven million different stories, and then the people that are then ripple effect with those seven million people. Yeah. It's yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, it's difficult for me to know for sure how much influence it's had. But I know it's been a good influence and will continue to be so. When, when I first announced to my family and my community that I was going to be a trainer and a, and a speaker and uh, write some books, uh, my family told me to get real. And they, they weren't being negative. I don't want to want it to sound that way. They just thought I'd lost my mind. Because if you could have known me back then in 1993, 94, and who I was and my ability, you'd have just said, well, it's, uh, you know, it's a pie <laughs> uh, promise here. It's just a, it's just a thin dream. It's never going to be reality most of it has come to pass. And, and what I've uh, come to believe is that all of us are capable of so much more than we often realize. I, I wouldn't have done any of these things if it wasn't for a guy 30 years ago seeing something in me and helping me to believe in myself. I didn't believe in myself. This guy believed in me. I believed in him. I thought he was something special I could see that he believed in me and I thought well maybe he can see something in me that I'm missing here and so that helped me gradually to believe in myself it, it was as I built my belief in myself and my ability to read because he said to me you see I bought into a lot of limiting beliefs about me and my ability and when I was at school teachers told me that I would never learn to read and write well because of having dyslexia and because of my life style where I was living with a gypsy family. I only went to school for about five months each year, divided between two or three different schools and then no school while we traveled and I was you know, always moving. So it was very, very limited education. And my parents did pay for me to have a private tutor that would come to the caravan and work with me. But I think even if I'd have stayed in one school the whole time, I would have struggled because of the dyslexia. It wasn't just moving. 
And so teachers told me, you, you won't learn to read and write, Brian. And I bought into that. And although I had the dyslexia, that became an added limitation. And then this guy said to me, his name was Mike Rosewan. He said, uh, I believe you can. I, I believe that if you really build your belief in yourself, Brian, you'll find a way. And I believed him more than the teachers. And gradually, he helped me to believe in myself. As I built my belief in myself, so I formed the brain cell connections, which compensated for the learning challenges. And the, and the words just sort of started to come into focus. The more I practiced, the easier it became, And within a year, I could read. The thing that took me much longer to crack uh, was uh, writing. And not just the spelling. I couldn't hold a pen. I'd, I'd never learned to do it. And there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> it sounds it's probably stupid, I know it sounds, but there's a lot of very fine muscle movements involved in writing. I could hold a paintbrush or a hammer or a saw. I was good at physical things, woodwork, metalwork. I could do all those things. But I just wasn't used to holding a pen because it wasn't part of my daily habit pattern. And so it took me much longer to learn to handwrite and to spell. And really, the, the, the acid test for me wasn't uh, uh, reading or even writing in the computer because we got a spell checker and those things. It was handwriting compliments, slips, letters, and cards in a good enough way that other people could actually read them. Uh, and, and that, for me, once, once I cracked that, I felt, yeah, I'm on top of it now. And interesting, you just picked up the pen with your left hand. Are you left-handed? I am left-handed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, le a left-handed dyslexic has uh, quite often an unusual neurology because while we talk about left brain and right brain, the latest brain science, which is called neuroplasticity, shows that the brain is so incredibly flexible that both sides of the brain can do all the different things. And just depending on the stimulus you receive and, and the particular influences you come under, some parts of the brain will rewire and develop more than others. A few years ago, my mother's friend had a stroke and couldn't speak anymore. And it destroyed the left side of her brain, which is normally the side we use for words. And she, she couldn't speak. Through willpower, through setting a goal, she stimulated the right side of her brain to rewire itself. And she learned to speak again through the right side of her brain. I have a, another friend in Italy who's uh, had a stroke and, and that's affected the movement on the left side of his body because he's lost that part of his brain. And again, through goal setting, and he's using my technique, he's stimulating other parts of his brain to take up the challenge, rewire themselves so that he can learn to walk again. I mean, he's going through the physio now and he's made so much improvement. So for someone who never took an exam in their entire life to creating programs where you can get certification and for helping people re rewire their brains, how does that feel? It feels good. I sometimes feel that I haven't done enough, if I'm honest. Uh, I sometimes sort of look at it and think to myself, could have done more, could have achieved more. I feel like there's more to come. I think that's uh, that's why I, I, I sometimes get a little bit frustrated. And I have a lot of people, of course, that, uh, that say to me, well, I've never heard of it. And and I think, yeah, yeah I, that's something I want to change. Goal mappings reached over a million children not too sure exactly how many, through state school. But really, it should be standard in school. Mm. I'm not saying it has to be my technique. I don't mean that. Teaching children the simple science of positive thinking, and teaching children how to set and achieve goals should be standard within our curriculum because it truly is a life skill. You just think about it for a moment. Once you learn how to set goals in an effective way so you increase your chances of achieving them, that is a skill that once mastered, you can apply to gaining all other skills, all other knowledge, all other abilities. It's life-wide. It's lifelong. You can use it throughout your entire life and you can use it for all the different things. Why are we not teaching it to our children as standard? 
Um, I, I have schools and school teachers that embrace it. They use it for themselves. They share it with their students. But really, it needs to be standard. And gradually, I think that that awareness is shifting. I think there is a growing realization within education that we need to help students learn life skills, not just academic skills. And I've certainly noticed within my corporate clients that more and more of them are now recruiting candidates based more on mindset than on skill set. They want you to have the skills, they'd like you to have the abilities, all of those things. And big employers have realized technology is moving so incredibly fast that whatever skills you join with, whatever qualifications you have at that time, you're going to need to learn new skills, gain new abilities within three to five years because of the pace and the rise of technology. Uh, last summer, I was in Vietnam making a presentation. And on the journey back from Vietnam on the flight, I watched a documentary from a professor in Harvard Business School who was saying that in the next 10 years, 25 million jobs that are currently done by people will be done by machines instead with the rise of artificial intelligence and robotics and computers. And it triggered the thought in me that many of our schools are equipping our children for a world that won't exist by the time they get of working age. You know, a lot of the things that our children are learning or taking qualifications in won't be there as a job necessarily in another 10 years when they're of working age. Right? It's going to change radically. So learning life skills such as self-motivation, finding a sense of purpose, your big why, learning how to set goals, uh, how you develop greater levels of personal responsibility, positive thinking, they are skills they can apply regardless. And the, the more we learn how to hold positive thoughts so that we form the brain cell connections, the more we're able to work with left and right brain. And what that leads to is an innovation mindset. And innovation is really the key for people to get on for the future. Innovation allows us to look at a situation that changes or an existing situation and see a higher evolution. So you hear a lot of, at the moment, people talking about, well, I need to pivot or a business needs to pivot because of the change in the world with COVID-19. That requires, if you're going to pivot, if you're going to change your life in any way, it requires an innovation mindset. It requires you to be able to look with your right brain and imagine a, a better scenario and equally work with your left brain to calculate what will need to be done and find that critical path. So the, the techniques I've created, like goal mapping, make that simple enough that children can do it and understand it. And my own, my own children have grown up creating their maps. I've got my, my folders right here because I'm always looking at my maps. I use them on a daily basis. So here's one. This is using the online program. So the words and the pictures are sort of together in one. Here's one uh, drawn on paper. And in fact, this is my uh, map here, just the pictures, not the words, of the seven million lives we talked about that I drew back in. Uh, this one's 08. This is the second one. The first one was originally 2006. That's incredible. So and I think what you're saying, it's all very well having your experimental mindset, but you also need to have people around you who are going to champion you because you were told at school you're never going to read, you're never going to write. And you believe that. Yeah. So it's not just having the the sort of open mindset and the experimental mindset. It's having people who are going to support you along the way. Yeah. If you look at any of the different schools of psychology. What they all agree with, really, is that the biggest influence on us, because we are we are the combination of nature and nurture. It's not one or the other. So even if we're born with certain influences and leanings, uh, they will be either enhanced or pulled back, depending on our life experiences, our nurture. 
And the biggest influence on us, on our nurture and the way that we grow is the people around us. So uh, in an immediate sense, that is family uh, and then things like friends and teachers. But as a small child, we, we look up to take our example. So not so much other children, but older family members, mums, dads, bigger brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, have a huge influence on us. And when we're very young and, and we are repeatedly told something, our conscious mind isn't developed. And so we're not able to evaluate it against a broad enough life experience. And we tend to start to accept it as true and we buy into it. And, it, and it, we actually then become that way because it becomes a subconscious influence for us to be that way. Uh, the other big influence on us as we get older is our community. And that can be work community or local community. The people we hang out with, their beliefs will really influence us into how we think we should live. And then beyond that, it is the media. And uh, unfortunately, so much of the media is negative. Bad news sells. And if we become overly immersed in that and society, uh, we are very influenced by it. And so we, I think if you are uh, challenged because of something negative that's happened in your life, you need to be a very strong-willed person to turn that around all on your own. Having some positive influence from another, especially someone that you look up to, I think becomes a major turning point because it, it gives that sense of hope uh, that we can. And I think this is why great leaders within organizations, and sometimes uh, we're lucky enough to have them within a government or something, uh, help people so much. They become inspiring. I've been very fortunate to work in some organizations where there have been some amazing leaders that really, really care about their people and their team and, and go that extra distance to try and help everybody uh, be at their best and bring out the talent in people. And sadly, it's, it's often the opposite. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, you're in a team or an environment where uh, the leaders are not so great. Ultimately, of course, we all need to learn to be our own leader and to believe in ourselves and bring out the best in ourselves. And that's why learning personal development techniques are important. But at the start of the journey, that's a, it's a big ask. And so having someone, and I think it's often the way when you hear someone's life story, there's going to be someone, a grandma, a granddad, an aunt or an uncle, a mum, dad, someone, that, that special teacher. I did have a couple of great teachers, actually, history teachers. I've always, I've always loved history since having a great history teacher years ago who saw something in me, you know, and, and I felt that. And even though I couldn't read and write, uh, I learned a lot of history. If you can't read and write, you actually develop a great memory. Can't make notes. <laughs> so you've got, to, you've got to learn to memorize things. And uh, it's actually an interesting thing with memory. The more you use it, the stronger it becomes. And my memory deteriorated once I learned to read and write. That's really interesting, yeah because I started making notes and going back and rereading them rather than memorizing facts and figures and, and all those things. Mm. So, I, and then I, I become interested into learning memory techniques, teaching those to the, to the children in school. So yeah, I, I think if, if you've got someone around you that inspires you and it, of course it doesn't have to be someone that you are uh, immediately related to, connected to in that way around it could be one of your uh, viewers listening in to one of your podcasts and inspired by someone they hear. And that, that begins the start of their journey and then believing that uh, they can be more, achieve more, live more. Yeah, that's absolutely already happening. It's incredible hearing back from people who have listened to one of the podcasts and they've realized that they need to write that book that they've always wanted to or they need to make yeah. that decision that they were putting off so it definitely is making it's having a ripple effect 
but I don't need to ask you what the the what if moment if you hadn't have had that special. It was it somebody Rosewall, did you say? What was his first name? Uh, Mike Rosehorn, his name was. Yeah, yeah. Rosehorn. If he hadn't have turned up on that sort of dark and gloomy moment back in 93, you know, I don't want to go to where that might be. I, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I was quite suicidal at the time, and it's not something that I have often spoken about. I don't think I would have ended my life. Uh, because I, I had thought about it, and I couldn't do that to my parents. They were 65 at the time. Their life had crashed. They'd become bankrupts. They were about to lose their home uh, in repossession. My brother's home had already been repossessed. So I knew that putting that onto my family was just an added burden. So I don't think I would have killed myself, but I, I wanted to die because life was so painful and so miserable, and I'd lost hope I, I really didn't uh, see a way forward for me and it was like it's like oh, I'm gonna just have to live with the with with the pain of it all and I you know I just imagined that I uh, I would go back and live in a caravan somewhere not that there's anything wrong with that at all my family still travel but of course even within that life there are different levels of uh, uh, affluence and enjoyment and quality of life and I could see that my quality of life wasn't looking too good and I felt hugely responsible to my parents to try and help look after them I mean, my father had just retired at 65 and then suddenly lost everything so I had to go back to uh, back to work almost immediately and I'm the oldest son and so I thought, I've, I've got to try and turn this around. It actually took me 10 years uh, to pay back the debt. I never went bankrupt. I didn't pay back the full million pound that was owing, but I paid back a lot, and it was enough for the banks and the creditors uh, to say they wouldn't repossess my parents' house, which was my driving motivation initially with my sales business. That was my why before I uh, developed my reading ability in a good way and then uh, went on to be a trainer and find that sense of purpose in helping others. So for the first couple of years, uh, it was very much about helping my family was the why, really. Um, more than helping myself, actually, I just felt very, very low. And so I'd, I think I would have, I would have just... Uh, fallen into a rut and and maybe ultimately I would have died because of not looking after myself I think would have been a likely consequence I was uh, uh drinking a lot at the time and just trying to lose myself and numb the pain and uh, wasn't prepared to go to the doctors and get help it was still quite a stigma to talk about depression and uh, mental well-being back then in the sort of the early and mid 90s so yeah, I think it would have been dire for me. Well, I'm just so impressed with the journey that you've taken us on today and, and shown just how simple science can be life-changing. Yeah, I had heard, uh, like nearly everyone has heard, that uh, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Made famous by Henry Ford. And that was the opening quote from this guy, Mike Rosewater, in the workshop. But rather than leaving it at that, he then showed why this quote actually has a science. When, when I'd heard in the past, and I think this is probably true for a lot of people, if you think you can, you can, if you think you can, you can't. It, it sounds like it's, well, it's someone's opinion. Like, be happy, be positive. I mean, we've all heard it, pull your socks up, get on with it. And, uh, okay, it might even be good advice, but it's not always very helpful. Sometimes you get a resistance towards it because you're not being helped to understand how. Uh, when this man said, if you think you can, you can, if you can, come, come, and here is why, and showed the simple science, as well as showing how positive thinking connects the brain cells, he also helped me to understand how negative thinking blocks the free flow of thought. 
the more negative we become, the more our brain closes down, shuts down, and it focuses on the object of our fear or negativity, which looks bigger in our mind. And this has evolved over many thousands of years as part of our fight or flight response. Uh, and it's a great thing when the problem we face is a hungry bear that wants to eat us for lunch. Because all you need to know is there's the hungry bear. Let me run away somewhere and climb a tree. And it's by running really fast and climbing the tree that you burn off all of the stress chemicals like cortisol. And through the exercise, you trigger the release of serotonin, just like athletes have a natural high when they work out. So if you're running away from that bear very fast, it, the exercise burns off the cortisol, triggers the release of serotonin, so it rebalances your brain chemistry. It works great when it's a hungry bear. And when the problem is, I don't have enough money to pay my bills, your brain closing down and focusing on that problem and it looking bigger and bigger and bigger doesn't help in any way. You just become stressed. And you, and you can't see the answers. All you can see is the problem, bills, 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 bills. And uh, the answers are very often needing a creative solution, which are on the edge of our vision. It's learning the science of positive thinking and how you hold that positive thought, even when you're in a negative situation, that helps you find the solutions, helps you find the way out. That's why it's important. And, uh, and that's what the guy helped me to understand that day. So I know that the audience are now going to be thinking, right, I need to get this goal mapping. Where can I find it? Tell us, Brian. Goalmapping.com. There you go. <laughs> I should also, you may already know, uh, but it is free. Uh, people can use the free online software, which I believe is the most powerful way. And also it's a lovely thing to draw your map on paper, uh, which is how it started out before we had the software some years back. So people can download the printable templates and instruction and they can print their map out on paper and then draw with colored pens, print the templates, or they can just go onto the software. And we have schools using the software. In fact, a lot of my family material is there on the website. There's also video of the workshop there and uh, other support material and techniques like checking your life balance. And all of it's freely available. There, there are some premium levels of the website. But people can go there, watch the video, do their map. It doesn't cost anything at all. Well, that sounds amazing. And I know that I mean, as a family, we all goal map. So it, it's, it's changed our lives. So I advocate it to everyone I speak to. So, yes, get out there and get goalmapping.com on your computer right now. And Thank you so much for coming on and sharing some very personal experiences with a lot of people. I know that it will resonate with a lot, some people and other people will be inspired by hearing your story because it, 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 you can't help fail by seeing the, the transformation that you've gone through. So thank you for that. My pleasure, Amy. Thank you. Have you got a final word for the audience, please? I, I think it is simply... Go create your goal map because that's what makes it work. It's reach 5 million people because it works, but it doesn't work by listening to me. I enjoy talking and uh, sharing what I have, but and, and I hope people find that inspiring. But what makes it work is people actually create the map. That's what forms the brain cell connections. And so that's my recommendation is Go do the map. And if you're interested, you can learn more. But doing the map is the main thing. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20-minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.